Welcome to the Living Without Fossil Fuel slideshow. Uh, my name is Alexis Ziegler. I'm going to talk to you about various projects I've worked on, uh, particularly uh, this one over here, Living Energy Farm. It's a project we're developing to build a community and a farm that operates without fossil fuel. Um, I should be clear that I do not speak for the other people involved in Living Energy Farm. Uh, all opinions expressed in this presentation are solely those of the author. The author does not speak as a representative of any other person or organization. Uh, this slide also displays a few other things I have published. Uh, over here on the left, we have Integrated Activism. That is a book recently published by North Atlantic Publishers. Um, e uh, Perennial Food, Easy and Reliable Methods for Growing and Propagating Fruits and Nuts. That's a pamphlet I have published, Culture Change. That's another book I have published. Um, my websites are conav.org, uh, Living Energy Farm has a website at livingenergyfarm.org. I'm also involved in the communities movement and the website for that is ic.org. Um, moving right along here, um, we're going to talk about how to live with uh, little or no fossil fuel and how to live comfortably because uh, perhaps a homeless person in a cardboard box is living without fossil fuel but most of us don't want to be cold and hungry, we want to be comfortable. So the question is, how can we be comfortable and still uh, live with much less or even no fossil fuel on a daily basis? We're all going to use durable goods, certainly, but day to day, I've actually been surprised at how easy it is to dramatically reduce fossil fuel use or even uh, eliminate it. So we'll start out with basic passive solar design. It's amazing that houses in the United States are built with no consideration of weather and climate in general. Uh, bas basic passive solar design is no more complex than simply putting windows on the south side of a house. And then as you can see in this drawing, you put a bit of an overhang. You want the distance from the top of the window to the bottom of the overhang to be roughly equal to the distance of the overhang, at least in our latitude, so that the summer sun angle uh, is blocked by the overhang. You don't get direct sun coming in those windows in the wintertime, but the winter sun angle, which is about 30 degrees, and our latitude comes in those windows and warms up the house quite a bit. Uh, passive solar design is no more or less expensive than any other uh, design, um, and it makes a house a lot more comfortable and a lot more energy efficient. It's quite amazing to me that every house is not passive solar design, but few are. Um, there are reasons for that, which we can discuss in a different slideshow. Um, the idea that, uh, well, first of all, we should say that, that residential buildings are the primary contributor in the United States to greenhouse gases. Uh, the energy we use to heat and cool residential buildings is enormous. Um, so it's in terms of addressing climate change, in terms of addressing this global environmental crisis that we're facing, um, how we live is enormously important. It's not the only issue, but it's a very big issue. The idea that green building is expensive or complicated is just silly. Um, it is as easy and simple as, as any other thing we do, certainly much simpler than more, most of the sophisticated technological uh, feats of our age. Um, this is a simple drawing of uh, thick wall construction. I often use straw bale, but I have used, in the case of this shed down here, that's built actually with crumpled up newspaper, uh, the walls and the ceiling both. There's two feet of crumpled up newspaper in the ceiling of that building. That's a small building. I built it as a tool shed, but I didn't want to have the summer sun baking me when I was in there trying to run a drill press or whatever. Um, so there's two feet of crumpled up newspaper. Works great. Um, stays perfectly cool in the summer. I actually camp out in that shed some, and I can sleep out there all summer in Virginia with no fan, no air conditioning, because there's windows on three sides and it's reasonably well insulated, at least in the summer heat. So you, uh, thick wall construction is really easy. You can do it with newspaper, leaves, baled straw is probably the easiest, but there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, I use stucco with some sort of moisture sealant on the outside. Uh, you can use earthen plaster or stucco on the inside. Um, so most houses are built with very thin walls. Thick walls work a whole lot better. The other advantage of very thick walls is you get these wonderful thick window sills, which in this case has this nice little tile job on it and becomes a little greenhouse for propagating my plants and growing plants through the winter. Um, the Living Energy Farm solar design, I wanted to come up with a solar design for that project that was cheap. Um, I looked into a lot of different designs. I have built houses with various radiant floor systems and radiant floors are wonderful in terms of you can being able to drive the heat down into the uh, 
the thermal mass that's under the house, the dirt and the rock and the slab under the house, this thing can radiate up into the house. The problem with radiant slab designs is they often use uh, flat plate solar collectors on the southern roof, which are quite expensive because uh, with a fluid-based system, uh, meaning you're using water or glycol, antifreeze, to go through those collectors, uh, the collectors have to be corrosion resistant, therefore they have to be um, copper, which means expensive. So I wanted to use an air-based system. There are a bunch of these air-based systems where you circulated warm air from the roof down around the house or under the floor, built back in the 70s and 80s, and they did a bunch of stupid things. Number one, photovoltaics were really expensive back then. Um, they operated on the model of trying to maintain a two degree temperature differential, in other words, imitating fossil fuel systems rather than trying to just build a good solar system. They built them in poorly insulated houses, and for all these various reasons, they didn't work very well. Well, the price of photovoltaics is such that we can afford somewhat larger motors now. Air is a very fluffy medium, so you need a larger motor if you're pumping air than if you're pumping fluid. Um, in the case of Living Energy Farm, we already have a 1,400-watt, 180-volt solar rack. It's a series solar rack, which I'll show you in a minute. In any case, that we use that to run our well pump to pump water because we need water for uh, domestic use as well as for irrigation on the farm. Um, so we have that 1,400 watts that in the summer needs to pump a lot of water. In the wintertime, it's not doing very much, so I can use it to run air pumps, um, blowers. So those blowers will take heat off the southern roof. The southern roof has uh, foam behind the sheet metal and then a metal roof, glass in front of that, collects heat. Uh, we pull that heat down through a duct system right under the floor and back up and around it goes. The blowers are hot wired straight into the 180 volt uh, solar rack. So the sun comes out, blowers turn on, sun goes down, blowers turn off. No controls, no problem. Very simple, relatively cheap, efficient, very effective heating system, although I will say this system's not complete yet. Like I say, I've built a number of fluid-based radiant systems, um, but I'm quite sure it'll work quite well. We'll tweak the design as we go, um, but we have to have a design that operates without fossil fuel, so we want to make heat, and given that Living Energy Farm is designed to to live without any fossil fuel, we don't want to have to chop up a bunch of wood with chainsaws either, so we want a very effective solar design. We also want it to be cheap so it can be replicated. This is the construction of our solar design. Uh, right where this young woman is sitting is where a big air pipe goes. We have actually reclaimed foam insulation in this case, so we do a perimeter insulation so the air circulates inside this insulation. It heats up the floor. It also heats up a bunch of dirt uh, under the house, so we eliminate computer controls. We eliminate uh, when they did these systems back in the 70s and 80s, they'd have a rock bed or something outside the house. They'd blow the hot air into the rock bed and then have a big battery bank and a set of computer controls to draw that heat back into the house. In this case, we just blow it right under the house. If it gets a little too warm, you can open the windows. But we have this very effective, very cheap thermal storage system that you might also just call dirt. Uh, we simply warm up the ground under the house, and that can store heat for days. Uh, the other radiant slab systems I have built will store heat for days, and this system is much larger and should store heat for quite a long time. Hot water heating is a big use of energy in the United States. All over the world, people use batch collectors. This is a simple batch collector here. It, all it is, uh, it's an insulated box. You, you can use an old refrigerator and put in a water heater tank in there and put a piece of glass over it. That's the simplest batch collector. This one's a little bit fancier in that it has stainless steel tanks with some black solar coating on them. You simply bring your water uh, into the bottom of the tank, it gets heated up, and then the water comes out the top of the tank and then goes on to where you use it. Um, these batch collectors can't go too far north. We're in Virginia. They certainly work quite well in Virginia. This simple, cheap little collector makes an enormous difference in terms of hot water supply. Somewhat more sophisticated system are the flat plates. This is a picture of a flat plate system here. We have a copper collector that has glass on the front. It thins the fluid out, so the fluid gets much hotter. It gets circulated down to a set of heat exchangers uh, connected to a set of water storage tanks. The advantage of the flat plate systems over the batch collectors is that um, they can store heat for much longer. So if you have a good sized flat plate system, you can heat up your water, and a day or two later you still have hot water. That's not so much true with the batch collectors. They have a, a more up and down kind of heating curve um, so Living Energy Farm, we've been relying on solar cooking. This is a very simple um, solar uh, parabolic dish cooker. It works great. 
That dish is about four feet across. It has a solar reflective material on it. If you say, my goodness, that looks like a satellite dish. Well, yes, you can use a satellite dish. It'll work just fine. Um, this is not actually a satellite dish, but in any case, um, that four-foot dish has the on a sunny day has the BTU output of a gas burner on medium. You can set a stick uh, out where that pot is, right about there uh, on a sunny day. It will set that stick on fire in three seconds. Um, has the, at the focal point there's it gets quite hot. We pull that pot in a little bit into the focal point just to spread the heat out. But we cook with this thing on a daily basis. These things are in common use all over the world, the less developed world. Uh, they work great. They're super simple, super cheap, super easy, much easier and uh, simple and faster than a solar oven, although it's more of a, uh, you know, it's, it's a cooker, not a baker as such. Um, this is our solar oven. Solar ovens are a little more complicated than a parabolic dish or a little more trouble to build. Um, they are also a little more finicky about, or just, uh, you can only really use them effectively in the summertime. You're not going to get that much oomph out of a solar oven in the dead of winter, whereas that solar cooker, e the parabolic cooker, even on a cold winter day, as long as we've got sunshine, we can cook on it. Um, this is our solar oven. We actually have used it more as a solar dryer, although it works just fine for baking in the summer, um, but we use it a bunch for drying. You can see um, peppers being dried in there. Uh, super simple, super easy, works great. Um, we use it a lot. This is a biogas system, which we are also using for cooking. On the left-hand side, uh, you see a digester, which is a 55-gallon drum full of manure and organic material. It's poured in the top. There's an overflow. Of, you can see, actually, just a little bit of the shadow of the uh, liquid level line right there. There's an overflow, actually, on the back side of that barrel. So the after about six weeks, this thing sets up an anaerobic digestion process. Uh, there's bacteria in there produce methane which is also known as natural gas it goes through this little tube over this barrel the blue barrel which is floating in a larger barrel which is full of water so as the gas uh, pushes this barrel up it fills up with methane uh, and then there's a T in the line back here and that runs off to a gas burner this particular setup is not very large doesn't produce an enormous amount of gas um, and we haven't developed the technology other people have done more with this technology than we have but in any case we've been using it some it's it's pretty easy um, we get, we're able to cook a meal every couple of weeks off of this, which is not a lot, but it's a fairly small system. Uh, industrial scale biogas is pretty common in this country. The Chinese historically developed millions of uh, household and village level biogas systems. They use them extensively. Uh, there is a question with broad scale use in that methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. So whether or not we would want to propagate millions of these around the world is is a question that one would want to ask. Um, another thing we're doing at Living Energy Farm is developing, using, mixing old technologies and new technologies. We have um, some brand new, very sophisticated pumps, because uh, on a farm you need to move water around a fair amount. You need irrigation water, you need drinking water, you need very, to do various things with water. We have a modern uh, pump that is uh, a submersible pump that's not in this picture. Uh, it's a very expensive, uh, very effective, uh, efficient pump. Uh, but we also want to pump irrigation water around, and we want pumps that we can, re we can rebuild. Our modern, efficient, submersible pump, though it's very effective, it's a black box. We can't fix it. Um, we have these uh, old pumps here. These are surface pr piston pumps. These are two different pumps. This one's running on a 300 watt uh, direct drive scooter motor. This is a 100 watt uh, DC motor, also direct drive, meaning there's just simply a solar panel hooked to the motor, nothing else. Um, some people claim you should use a doohickey called a linear current booster in between your panel and your motor. We haven't been using them because they're a bit expensive, and so far that hasn't been a problem, but other people have a different opinion. These are old piston pumps. So this. Uh, wheel here spins around, there's a little rod that goes back and forth, and there's a piston right in there that shoves the water out. Um, this one up here will pump about 10 gallons a minute, this one down here will pump about 3 gallons a minute. Um, the advantage of these old pumps is that they're infinitely rebuildable, they are simple cast iron, as long as you don't freeze them out in the winter time, you can rebuild them forever. Um, they also can pump water at any speed. You'll notice I've got this one labeled 300 watts, this one labeled 100 watts. Well, it's the same kind of pump, it's an almost identical pump. We simply slow this one down and run it a little bit slower. The modern centrifugal pumps 
have to spin at pretty high speed to be effective. They're made to spin generally around 3,600 RPM, and, and anything less than that, they don't work very well. Well, these little pumps, you can turn them with a scooter motor, as we're doing running off of a solar panel. The scooter motor slows down. When the sky gets cloudy, that's fine. The pump keeps pumping. Uh, if your motor burns out, you can hook up an exercise bi bicycle um, to the pump, which we have done. Um, I've taken these pumps to demonstrations, and you just put an exercise bicycle beside it and run a belt or a chain around that, around the, uh, the, the pulley here and just start pumping water. You can sit there beside it and push the pulley with your hand and pump water. So these are very versatile pumps. There are modern versions of this pump, actually. I think it's Dankoff, or one of the big pump companies makes them, sells them for about 2000 um, bucks. But these are old cast iron things that we picked up for much cheaper than that. Um, this is the solar rack that runs our modern pump. This is a 1400 watt, um, uh, 180 volts. So there's six panels. Each panel is 30 volts. They're stacked up in series, so we get 180 volts. Down the hill is our well. Um, that pumps water for the farm. This, this is at Living Energy Farm. And then the house sits over to here to the left where we can run our blowers, as I said earlier. Uh, grid tie solar is uh, not such a good thing, but using solar uh, in a context where it can be used effectively, where it is used modestly, solar energy is a wonderful thing. Uh, this solar rack will do the work literally of probably 30 or 40 people. If you had to have human beings running those piston pumps, we've had human beings running the piston pumps without the solar panel, the piston pumps in the previous slide, and it takes about four people to keep up with a 100 watt panel um, because that solar panel can sit there and just pump all day long and people have to stop and rest. So if a 100 watt uh, is four people, then 1400 watts is a whole bunch of people. Um, so uh, a very modest amount of solar electricity can do quite a lot of work as long as your needs and demands are scaled at a modest level, at a community level, and you're not trying to run air conditioners and toasters and all that, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, at Living Energy Farm, we're going to, we don't want to have candles for lighting because burning your house down is not very efficient, not very sustainable. We discovered, a friend of mine gave me an old battery, said this is a 100-year-old battery, still works. I'm saying you're crazy, uh, batteries don't last that long. The modern, all the modern standalone solar electric systems use lead-acid batteries. Lead-acid batteries have a very high electrical output, but they only last, generally they last five years. In some cases you get seven or eight or nine years out of them, but mostly around five. I've seen some die in three. But this is a battery called uh, nickel iron. It was, you can see over here, made by Thomas Edison Incorporated. This is an original Thomas Edison battery. It is old. And as you can see in this picture, it still works. We charged it up and it works just fine. The trick with nickel iron batteries is they're a bit expensive and they have very low output compared to lead acid. The, on the positive side, they have enormous durability compared to lead acid and they have a much, much deeper cycle. With lead acid batteries, you have to keep your cycle within 5% of the rate of impacity. And if you drain the battery down, in other words, if every day you really drain the battery down, you'll kill the battery very quickly. Uh, nickel iron batteries have about 95% uh, um, impacity draw. In other words, you can discharge the battery about 95% without damaging it. So a dramatic difference in how much you can discharge them. So nickel iron batteries are very well suited to exactly what we do with them, which is to power uh, DC LED lighting. We're not running inverters. We're just running DC LED lighting, and they work great for that. It's a low-level charge. They can run half or forever, um, uh, an ideal technology suited to a specific use, and they are very non-toxic. Lead-acid batteries are exactly what they say they are. They are lead and they are acid, sulfuric acid. They are very toxic. They are shipped to the third world to be recycled. They poison a lot of people. Uh, the, the acid in lead acid batteries um, is, uh, will, <laughs> will do you quite a bit of damage if you ever get it on your skin or your clothing. Uh, the nickel iron batteries have uh, an electrolyte that's not harmful at all, so even if you spill it, it's not going to hurt you. Um, and the electrolyte is a metal preservative, not a corrosive. So they're very durable batteries. This is the 500 watt solar system that uh, runs our nickel iron uh, for lighting. Uh, works just fine. That's currently mounted onto the roof of our tool barn. Uh, another technology that we are using at Living Energy Farm is wood gas. This is a picture dating back to the 1940s. 
Wood gas is a process by which you gasify wood chips. The gasifier in this case is this gizmo bolted onto the side of the truck. Uh, the wood chips are stored in there. Down at the bottom there's a hearth. The wood chips are essentially partially burned uh, and a mixture of carbon monoxide and various other gases are pulled off the wood chips, run into the intake of the gasoline engine, and they will run the engine at about 80% of the rated horsepower. Uh, now, in Europe, in World War II, there was an enormous crisis related to the war, fuel shortages. The agricultural system in some countries con converted to wood gas very quickly, and they ran wood gas for a few years. Wood gas is a very inconvenient fuel, and in the context of World War II, there was deforestation that developed even within a few years. Uh, this idea that we can go back to biofuel and use it for industrial purposes is just plain crazy. Uh, we will deforest the entire world very quickly if we do that. But on a farm scale, this is our gasifier, and to the left of it, well, actually there's two tractors in this picture. Uh, this tractor is, uh, the wood gasifier is sitting there because it's currently being bolted to the tractor. That's a 1961 gasoline tractor. That one over there is actually a 1939. Um, so for these small tractors on farm scale use, you need power. And, you know, we can think we're going to do it with draft animals, and we are going to have draft animals that live in the energy farm. But about a third of your land, if you're running draft animals, gets consumed in supporting the draft animals. So the question of whether we can support 7 billion people with draft animals, nope, can't do that. Uh, can we support 7 or 8 or 9 billion people indefinitely with industrial agriculture? Nope, not going to work either uh, because of fossil fuels, because of pollution. And it's our hope, our belief that farm scale use of technologies like wood gas, which give you a lot of power in a, in a concentrated package basically, uh, can allow us to run a farm that is fairly high productivity with uh, sustainable renewable outputs, inputs and outputs on the farm. Our bylaws, the uh, Living Energy Farm bylaws, expressly prohibit wood gas over the road. In other words, we're not going to try to run cars on this stuff, just the tractors, no more, no less. Um, so we're hoping that it can be sustainable on that basis. We are going to have draft animals there. The, the oxen on the left actually belong to a friend in our, of ours. The small ones on the right were our oxen. We kept them for a while. We've actually retired them just because at the startup phase of this project, we had too much going on and couldn't take care of them. We're probably going to bring back in some mules. We're going to keep, again, as I mentioned with the water pumps, we tend to scale our technology. So we have modern, sophisticated, efficient technologies, which in this case for us is wood gas and the tractors. And then we have other technologies below that simpler, more renewable technologies that may be less efficient, but will also work. So we're probably going to get a pair of mules shortly. Um, the different trade-offs between different draft animals, uh, mules and horses are a bit more heat tolerant, a bit faster. Oxen are cheaper and easier to come by. They're just training cows, basically. Um, composting toilets, uh, technology that I have built and employed in various places. Uh, in the United States, we have an exceptional proclivity for taking resources and turn it, turning them into pollution. This takes pollution and turns it back into a resource. The simplest composting toilet design, and one of the most effective, is simply to have a two-tank system. You have two tanks, or one big tank with a big a baffle in the middle. You have an air gap under your pile of organic material. You have a seat on top, and the human waste go in there. You use this tank for up to a year or so, and when it gets uh, starts to get full, you close the door on that side and you use this tank and you, by the time this tank gets full, this material over here has decomposed, decomposed and the pathogens have been neutralized. Um, a simpler version of this same approach is to simply use 55 gallon drums called the Fiji net system. So if you imagine each side of this tank being a, a different 55 gallon drum and instead of having two you could have three or ten or however many you want and you fill up one drum and roll it aside, fill up the next drum, roll it aside um, and let the drum sit long enough to decompose and, um, and for the pathogens to be neutralized, then you can use it as fertilizer. Uh, in Virginia, the state health code requires that the material coming out of here be buried. Uh, I feel comfortable burying it under mulch on the fruit trees. Um, whether or not you want to use it in your vegetable garden is up to you. Human waste is used as night soil a lot in the third world. As long as it is not poured into a, directly into a rice paddy, that would be really foolish. You can plow it into the ground, and the pathogens are controlled fairly effectively, um, but that's a complicated subject. In this case, we're simply trying to avoid, uh, uh, simply trying to recapture at least some of the nutrients in the human waste. The direct use of night soil actually captures the nitrogen content, 
much more effectively, I have learned. You lose a lot of nitrogen even with a good composting system. And nitrogen may not sound like a big deal, except for industrial agriculture, it's what uh, it, <laughs> nitrogen, the fixed nitrogen of chemical fertilizers, what's allowing us to keep 8 billion people alive on the planet or headed towards 8 billion. Without chemi fixed chemical nitrogen, fixed by fossil fuel processes, we would all starve fairly quickly. So handling nitrogen in the future is going to be a big issue. Whether we'll do that with batch composters or something else, I'm not sure. This is a composter I built, nice tile floor, uh, just off of a house. Um, to make the point that they don't have to be crude and awful, they can be, you know, nice and uh, a, a decent place to go into. Um, so that's composters. This is another technology I've, uh, I've installed. There's a company called Zomeworks that builds a commercial uh, version of these. That Z O M E works. The Zomeworks ones sell for about 400 bucks. You can build them yourself much cheaper. Simple skylight covers. If you've already got a building with skylights, you can put a cover over it about a foot over the skylight. This is a south-facing roof. This is the summer position for these skylight covers. So in the summertime, it blocks the direct heat but lets light come in the sides. And then in the wintertime, you'll notice these long poles. The skylight cover kicks up to the end of those poles and is sloped in an angle like that. So these skylights become solar collectors makes an enormous difference with skylights, turns them from a big thermal liability into a big thermal asset. This is an experimental technology or experimental to us. We haven't employed it. A community in Colombia uh, called Gaviotas uh, developed uh, high temperature solar thermal storage. We have realized uh, working on living energy farm that for us, now we have very modest energy demands. We're not driving to work. We don't have an air conditioned house. We don't have toasters and air conditioners. And all of those things, that cooking is actually our single biggest use of it, daily use of energy. Um, we've been using a combination of wood and uh, solar and biogas so far. I want to build one of these high temperature solar cookers, but that's, um, we haven't done it yet. But this is the picture of the one from Gaviotas. You simply have a solar collector, you use oil in this case, I think they were using peanut oil, pump it into a tank, store it at several hundred degrees, at which point it can come out and be circulated in steam jacketed kettles. Steam jacketed kettles are common commercial cookers. That's simply a pot with another pot kind of wrapped around it so the fluid can circulate around the outside of the pot and transfer the heat. Um, I'm not sure how much we're going to be able to do with this, but I would really like to be uh, for us to be able to do something with this because this would have much lower inputs than the biogas. The biogas system I showed you earlier has to have a significant amount of organic material going into it, number one. Number two, it has to be fed on a daily basis, more or less. And number three, there's the question of, question of methane leakage. So I'm not sure if this system will work. All I have from Gaviotis, I've been in touch with them, and I can't get any inf more information out of them. All I have is this drawing and some mention of it in their book. I don't know how well it worked. I don't know how well it worked for them, and I haven't built it yet. If it did work, it would be great because it would allow you to collect solar energy one day and use it the next day for cooking. That would be absolutely splendid. Um, but I don't know if it's going to work or not. There are some commercial heat transfer fluids on the market, um, so coming up with the fluid would not be a problem. I think storing three, four, five hundred degree heat is going to be pretty tricky. That's probably going to be the limitation of the system. This is another uh, technology that we haven't, we've researched but haven't built. This is a solar ice maker. There's two organizations at least that have developed these. One is called Stephen. Uh, that's an acronym for something, or Stevens, I think there's an S on the end. The other is called the Isaac Ice Maker. They're, they're basically the same thing. What you have is a parabolic solar collector uh, with a pipe in front of it. Uh, that pipe runs up, goes through a coil. The coil is either exposed to the air for cooling or submerged in a water bath for cooling and then an ammonia storage tank. This is an ice maker or refrigerator, if you want to use that term, it has no moving parts, no electronics, no motors, no nothing. What happens uh, is that during the, the uh, you put a, a solar absorptive chemical in this pipe uh, in front of the solar parabolic collector. The ammonia uh, is collected in that pipe at night. During the day, it is heated and pressurized. The pressurized ammonia comes up here, goes through this coil. The heat is largely evaporated off the coil, and the ammonia is pressurized down into a tank. At night, the collector cools off, the ammonia travels back up, back out to this pipe, and the uh, expansion of the ammonia in this tank as it pushes its way back uh, absorbs heat. So you can make a block of ice on a 24-hour cycle. 
So this is the kind of thing where, you know, in a private household, it wouldn't, people have gotten accustomed to their refrigerators, but having a block of ice you could pick up and carry inside and stick in an old-fashioned ice box would be great. Uh, this technology was developed. The, the fellow who did the work for Stevens um, intended this to be used in the third world or in the underdeveloped world. Uh, you know, for village uh, health clinics or wherever people needed it. He wanted to make something simple and cheap that they could use. So let's talk about ecology, <laughs> real ecology, living with little or no fossil fuel. What's happened is that because of a lot of political pressure, uh, the environmental groups have tried to sell Americans the idea that we can maintain our current lifestyle by adding renewable energy onto the top of it. That is uh, a lie. What's really works, what's actually true is that um, real ecology is 90% context. Um, what does that mean? Who is using it? Where are they using it? What are they using it for? In other words, in a village where resources are close to their use, where the field that's generating biofuel that's used in a biogas digester or for wood gas or whatever is right next to the village so it doesn't have to be transported very far, where human beings can turn on and turn off uh, solar heaters, uh, solar collectors, where, where they can uh, put their hands on and use solar cookers, that sort of thing. Uh, things come together. You get a, a complementarity, a, a complementing of different systems, an integration of systems that is much more ecological, much more effective than when things are broken apart are the, as they are in uh, industrial society. So ecology is 90% context. Um, it is 9% conservation. Um, so I've seen people build very expensive solar collection systems on houses that were badly insulated. It's really stupid. If you take just a s small amount of money you would spend building sophisticated solar or wind doohickeys and invest, them, invest that money, th those resources, in insulation, then you get much, much more effective results. 1% of uh, ecology is energy source. If you've done the proper locating of, of context of where something is, you've done all you can to make your systems run efficiently, then you need an energy source. But fossil energy would actually be sustainable in the right context with the right conservation for the most part. Um, this pyramid has been inverted by the environmental groups, but this is what really what works. Uh, context, conservation, and energy source is the least important. How does that play out in the real world? How hard is it to d dramatically reduce the amount of fossil fuel energy we use? Well, I've crunched a bunch of numbers. Um, this is a straw bale house that I built. It has a big solar collector system on the roof. That solar collector system is a bunch of flat plates that um, heat up the domestic hot water for the house as well as heating the radiant slabs. But what's uh, most uh, significant about this house is it's a cooperative house. So there's not one individual living in there or two people. Uh, it's a cooperative house. So um, when I crunched the numbers on this house, I was actually quite surprised. It comes out at 9% average residential energy use. In other words, somebody living in, in that house on a per capita basis is using 91% less energy than the average American. That's because of the combination of cooperative use thick straw bale walls, and then solar heat on top. You bring those thing, three things together and the results are, the math starts to do magic. It's really quite extraordinary. Um, if you do any one of those things by themselves, well, cooperative use by itself has more impact than anything else. Insulation is cheap and easy and has a big impact. But if you then bring renewable energy in after you're on top of cooperative use and good insulation, you get tremendous results. Uh, this picture over here is Dancing Rabbit. This is an eco-village in Missouri. They estimate their average energy use at about 10%. Uh, they have straw bale buildings, cooperative use. Uh, they've done more with solar electric than I have. At least um, this house doesn't have solar electric. Um, but anyway, cooperative use, good insulation, good context. Uh, this is Twin Oaks. This is a community in Virginia. This is their, one of their uh, an ecologically oriented building. Uh, again, cooperative use, thick walls. They didn't use straw bale on this one. This was actually two by eight walls, so they're, you know, 10 inch thick walls. Um, and then they add solar on top of that. So again, good t context, uh, community use, uh, good insulation, and then you add renewable energy on top of that. 
Twin Oaks is not particularly focused on energy conservation, actually. This one building is really well done. Their other buildings are kind of awful, frankly. Um, they're cooperatively used, but they're old buildings, cheaply built. So they come in at about 40% average energy use. And one has to recognize that most people in the world, uh, probably 5 billion people in the world, live sustainably uh, because they can't afford to do otherwise. Um, they're living simply, modestly. Um, the bottom line is that, that cooperative use makes an enormous, is the single most uh, important aspect of sustainability of renewable energy, making renewable energy work. Um, but, it in, in, but it involves modesty. And, uh, we've been sold this message that we can be immodest, that we can uh, do what we want to do and burn up as much energy as we want to burn up as long as it comes from some supposedly renewable source. Uh, the result of that, this is a picture in Charlottesville actually shooting right out the back of my backyard. This is the same shot except a, a far out shot. So you can see this is a, a new subdivision. These houses sold for between 350 and half a million dollars. Uh, cul-de-sac subdivision, which I guess everybody wants. One, ha one couple or you know, maybe a kid or two in these nice big houses. Everybody's got their own vehicle. And back here we see a grid tie solar rack. Here's your grid tie solar rack. It's the same picture except a bit more up close. Now, what's the context of this house? Private use, thin walls, two by four, maybe two by six walls. Um, private use, no passive solar orientation. You see, there's no attempt to put any decent amount of windows on the south side. Uh, bad insulation, bad context. These people, even though they're in the city, that improves the context a little bit. Still, they're driving to work. They're not walking to work. They do all that, and then they put this huge solar rack on the roof, uh, not to speak too disparagingly and to make comparisons, but Living Energy Farm has uh, 2,300 watts of photovoltaic power. We can easily support two dozen people with that. Right now, there's nobody living at Living Energy Farm full time um, because we're building our house yet. The project is still very new. So here we have, it's hard to say how big that is. That's somewhere between seven and 10 kilowatts, I would guess. Um, probably six or seven, uh, and it doesn't cover the use in that house. We're pretending that these uh, grid tie photovoltaic systems have no externalities. In fact, they have large externalities. Uh, there's a lot of toxic materials and heavy mining involved in the production of photovoltaic panels. And when you're using them at a rural scale to pump water, they're enormously valuable. If you try to keep up, like I said earlier, trying to keep up with one 100 watt panel is takes uh, four or five people. In this case, we've got this massive energy source that's essentially being thrown away. Um, it's just, it's, it's madness, frankly. There, there's a lot of toxic materials involved in these panels. They're being put on a house that's badly insulated, that has uh, no thought given to ecological impact. And here's the kicker of it all. You see the little satellite dish right there? Shades the panels in the morning. All of these big grid, grid tie systems I've seen, uh, most of them have shading, in other words, or they're not very oriented very well. Uh, the bottom line is they're, they're a psychological uh, uh, addendum. They are not really um, uh, intended as an eco, they're, they're thought of as an ecological thing, but they're, the environmental impact is increased, not decreased, to put a big grid tie solar rack on your roof. So let's review. Uh, the current supply side approach funded by tax rebates, these big grid tie systems are funded by tax rebates is based on the assumption that renewable supply di displaces fossil fuel energy generation. Historical evidence does not support this conclusion. The variability of renewables means that one must produce much more energy that is being used to cover the fluctuations of wind and sun. In other words, with a big grid tie system like this, you know, on a sunny day at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it's pumping out a bunch of energy, but the folks who run the big uh, power plants, the baseload power plants they're called, this is the coal and nuclear plants, they can't heat those plants up um, and cool them off instantly. It takes hours and hours to heat up a big coal plant or a big nuclear plant. So to cover the fluctuations in any renewable uh, renewables that come online, they pretty much have to keep the same old grid running. So they, they might dump energy at times because they've overheated the plant and can't use it. Um, but for the most part, uh, grid tie, solar, or even wind systems, this, the wind is so variable and the sunshine is so variable it does not mean that they get to shut the, the coal and the nuclear plants down. They have to keep them running to cover base load. Um, so if you're not addressing base load, you're playing games. Um, number two, lower energy prices simply stimulate more use. 
So if we put in a bunch of renewables and tax rebates to bring energy prices down, we still don't address the issue of how much energy people use. It's called Jevons Paradox. The more energy available, the more people use it. Um, and you see from this uh, picture, we've got our SUVs and our uh, pickup trucks. Uh, people use what energy is available, and producing more energy uh, does not uh, is not an ecological thing to do. It does not help our global ecological situation at all. If anything, it makes it worse. The question, again, is context and conservation. Those are the issues. If you're not addressing that, you're wasting your time. More production equals more pollution. Spain has uh, seen a 40% increase in carbon pollution in the last 20 years, in spite of being a leader and the installer of solar and wind power. Renewable energy production by itself does not reduce fossil fuel use. Um, if you have a chance, I would encourage you to read my book, uh, Integrated Activism. I address some of these issues in the, the broader social, political, historical context of uh, the relationship of ecology and democracy. Uh, there's another uh, recent book called Green Illusions by Ozzy Zenner, which also addresses, he's more specifically focused on the um, ecological impact of these uh, grid tie systems and other supposedly renewable energies. Um, another renewable energy that's been gaining some traction lately, politically, economically, is uh, biofuels. In Virginia, Dominion Power is getting tax rebates to burn up trees to generate electricity to run people's air conditioners and tumble dryers, as if that's a new idea. Where he'll, here's a log hauler uh, from the late 1800s hauling piles of logs after logs after logs after logs after logs going off in the, di the distance there. What people don't realize is the United States was deforested. Everything but the most res remote swamps and mountaintops were deforested by the mid-1800s, specifically to generate steam for the most part. And that's when firewood became so expensive that uh, coal was substituted for firewood, and then we saw coal become the dominant fuel. That transition actually happened much earlier uh, in the early 1600s in Europe. So in the early 1600s, um, Europe surpassed what the biofuel economy could support. In the United States, we surpassed it around 1850. Uh, that to think we can go back to that biofuel economy is just plain insane. It, it's historically misinformed is what it is. Uh, but our, we're giving our power companies tax rebates to burn up trees. Again, it's a, it's a psychological game that we're playing, a, a palliative kind of environmentalism. We put, put a grid tie solar on badly insulated houses. We burn up trees instead of turning off the tumble dryers. Um, it is a disastrous and insane approach. Um, and as I pointed out, there are other approaches that work much better. Uh, what makes renewable energy not work? The supply side approach. This is your hydrogen and veggie oil powered stretch Hummer, kind of an extreme icon of the supply side approach. We can do anything we want to do as long as it is fueled by some sort of quote unquote renewable energy. It is a form of collective insanity that has uh, gripped our society uh, to think we can uh, do it that way. So let's review. Uh, I'll go through, I know this is, slide's got a bunch of words on it, but I'll go through it fairly quickly here. The center column is a list of technologies. And what does renewable energy, when does renewable energy make ecological sense? So we have a list of renewable energy technologies. On the left-hand side, we have private housing in the mainstream, meaning this is kind of what everybody does, or in community use, at a village level uh, use. So if we look at passive solar, uh, in the mainstream housing, it works great. Passive solar is something you kind of can't do wrong. It's hard to do wrong. You just need windows on the south side. At a village level, it works great, too. Um, biofuels, uh, do they work in private housing in mainstream America? No, they are disastrous. The centralized scaling, meaning they're trying to build enormous biofuel farms, uh, this uh, consumptive in use, it doesn't address consumption at all. It just doesn't work. It is madness. In, at a village level, biofuels could work great. Um, the scaling can be modest. The use is close to the production. Uh, you can integrate systems, which you cannot do in the mainstream. So you can uh, get various uses out of your biofuels in various ways uh, and reclaim um, pollutants into fertilizers and that sort of thing. Super insulation. Does it work in uh, private housing? It does not because it's too expensive. People do not build thick walls because the trade-off is between square footage and thick walls. 
And I've been through this over and over and over again with my environmental friends. They said, oh, we can't afford to fix up our houses. Oh, but by the way, we just redid our kitchen and the upstairs, and the house is really pretty, but we can't afford to make the walls any thicker. I've heard that story so many times. I just shrug. I don't even worry about it anymore. But that's what everybody does, including a bunch of environmental activists who own private houses. They don't build thick walls. Well, at a village level and community, there is at least a mathematical advantage to building thick walls, whether or not people choose to. So super insulation can work great. Multiple users divides the cost. In other words, if you've got uh, shared use of, of any facility, you can afford to invest more in making the walls thicker and into putting uh, better renewable energy systems in that facility, whatever kind of facility it, it is. Grid tie photovoltaics, does it work poorly? Does it work uh, in private housing? It, it works poorly because there's no incentive to conserve and the externalities are ignored. Uh, people just pretend there are no externalities, meaning no pollution, whereas the externalities are quite large, quite significant, um, and people keep running their crazy consumptive tumble dryers, air conditioners, whatever, and pretend they're doing something better. The same is actually true in community. Grid tie is just a dead loser as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there's, again, there's no incentive to conserve and externalities are ignored, same in community as anywhere else. Off-grid photovoltaics, uh, in other words, standalone photovoltaic electricity. Does it work in the mainstream? Works poorly because people have such large energy demands, they try to put in large banks of lead-acid batteries to meet heavy demand. Uh, they still don't get what they want out of it. The lead-acid batteries are not sustainable, they're toxic, they're kind of awful. In community, off-grid can work a lot better. Uh, the energy use is much more modest. The scaling allows for better investment. As I said, at Living Energy Farm, we're using the nickel iron batteries. Um, so uh, it can work a lot better. Solar cooking is where you really see a difference between uh, village level use and private housing. Solar cooking, the parabolic cooker I showed you earlier, is super simple, super easy. You can hardly even call it a technology. It's, it's just so easy. Um, but in the mainstream, in priv with private housing, uh, the way we set up things in the United States and in the rest of the industrial world, it doesn't work because nobody wants to use it because everybody's commuting to work. It simply doesn't fit with the lifestyle. At a village level, it works great because one person can cook for other people. One person can tend the cooker. Um, so solar cooking is very simple, very easy, hardly even a technology, and it works great at, at a community level or at a village level. Uh, high temperature solar storage. Again, this is somewhat experimental, but it, it's not going to work in the mainstream either because nobody's going to fiddle with it. Um, you're going to have to be there to fiddle with it. Again, it could work fine at a village level. Biogas, uh, it's not going to work in the mainstream because in, with private housing because nobody's going to be there to tend it every day. Nobody's going to be able to, there to, f to, f to uh, pour the materials in or else they're not going to have time. Uh, in uh, village level where you can divide up work, one person can tend the biogas while somebody else is doing something else. Biogas works fine. Wood gas, it's not going to work in the mainstream. The reason ethanol and biodiesel have been so popular is that they um, support the illusion that we can continue with a commuter society um, using biofuels, which is a lie at an ecological level. Uh, wood gas is a, is a fussier, more difficult, less effective um, biofuel than ethanol or biodiesel, but it's lower grade. You're using wood instead of food to make your biofuel, and it can work well at a village level. It requires skill to use. Um, it's more like having a wood stove instead of a uh, thermostatic system, but it could work, and I think it could be sustainable at a village level. Um, so the summary then is that renewable energies are very well suited to village level use and are um, don't work in private housing. They just don't work. They need attention. They are dispersed. They are intermittent. Renewable energy works in the right context. It does more harm than good in the wrong context. But all of that begs the question. Uh, the technologies I'm showing you are not high-tech computerized stuff. Um, they are hundreds or thousands of year old, years old, most of these technologies. They are simple. They're easy. They simply require some degree of modesty. But it begs the question of how do we make environmental values more of a priority? Why don't people care? Um, they don't care because the externalities are on down the line. Um, a lot of, well, we, a lot of us have children. A lot of people have families. They love their children. We all love our children very dearly. But the impact we're having on their lives is so removed. Um, our culture is, is suffering basically a collective psychosis. 
um, a disconnect from reality. We are consuming our children, our grandchildren, um, and we don't want to think about that because taken all together, uh, we've been fed all these messages about um, that we can keep doing what we're doing as long as we uh, put a little green paint uh, on the trim and call it environmental. Life can go on. But how do we make more uh, environmental values more of a priority if we're choosing to do that? How do we do that? Well, I think the trick is simply choosing to rely on them. You'll notice, I've noticed, that people who live in a city, if let's say you got a friend who lives in a city and they commute to work on their bicycle. Well, they got a good bicycle. Um, they don't have a piece of crap bicycle. Then they move out to the country and they can't get around on their bicycle because the distances are too far and they get a car. Well, then they've got a good car. So the bottom line is we take care of what we, what we rely on. Um, if we choose uh, to rely on cars, we've got really nice cars, and most Americans have really nice cars. If we choose to rely on a bicycle, then we have really nice bicycles. But the idea that we can add on some environmental technology and not rely on it, then it uh, doesn't work. The renewable technology becomes token. It isn't well taken care of. The solar panels don't even face south. They're shaded. It's just a funny game we play. Whereas if we disconnect from the grid and you're relying on your solar panels, then you'll notice if those dang things are shaded. You get up there and fix them. If you're relying on your bicycle and your bicycle gets broken, you fix it. So um, we have to choose to rely on uh, our environmental values. We have to choose to disconnect um, or else it's not going to work. What makes renewable energy work? Uh, in a word, community. Uh, this is a picture of a party. I was actually at this party back in the 1990s, early 1990s. Uh, the irony of all of this is that uh, living cooperatively, using resources cooperatively, would actually be a higher quality lifestyle than we have now. We would have better social connections. We would have better support for when we're sick or when we need help. Um, and as you can see, <laughs> people living in community have fun, at least some of the time. Um, but we've been caught up in this collective psychosis for various political, economic, mi military reasons. We've developed this heavy, heavy industrial society, uh, and we're trying to put some green paint over the top of it, and it's not working, it's not going to work. Um, like it or not, you have to choose between your car and your house or your children and the entire global ecosystem that will allow them to live. You know, all of a lot of environmentalists tell people what they want to hear. I tell people what I understand to be true. So telling people you can't have your private car in your private house is a hard message. People don't want to hear that. But that's true. That's basically true. You cannot, um, with renewable energy, generate as much energy as we need, would need, to support private cars and private houses. Cooperative use, uh, some sort of community living, and there's a lot of variability in how people live, how people develop cooperative systems. But integrating community-scale, modest systems in the right context, and with the right uh, conservationist approach, uh, we can live sustainably. Um, and that involves making choices that are more difficult to sell politically. Um, but you have to choose. You have to choose. You can't say you haven't heard the answer. The answer is simple. It's easy. It's not difficult at all. It would improve your personal quality of living. Uh, and I've given this message to thousands of people. I've, I've spoken in front of many, many audiences. And very few people listen to it because the collective psychosis has far more grip than my humble words, and I understand that. But I also uh, know that simply from the, uh, the perspective of physics, physics don't care about our politics. And the changes we are creating in a global atmosphere and global ecosystems doesn't matter. The mind games we play, it doesn't matter. The political games we play, the, the ecological, global, physical changes that are occurring as a result of our industrial activity are going to march forward uh, unless and until we develop a, a culture, a society that can more consciously and purposefully address that. Uh, my book, uh, Integrated Activism, talks about the, the whole political economic side of that some more. This slideshow was uh, focused specifically on the renewable energy and conservationist uh, side of it. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the slideshow. I hope uh, you got something out of it. Um, I'm going to produce some more slideshows, I hope, uh, um, that do address some of the historical, political, economic uh, relationships between ecology and politics. Um, thank you for listening. Have a good day.